have a practice final, but I have some multiple choice questions that we can take a look at. Some other questions. Look at from this is from the summer. Summer goes pretty fast, so I should run more tests than it. But let's take a look at these problems here. Let's kind of review. So number one, stronger oxides or weaker oxides are driving force for double replacement reaction. Okay. Sure, Paul. What are some of the other driving forces that you know? Like, um, we have things like precipitation, stronger acid, weaker acid. Gas formation. You know, if we're looking at a at a double replacement, is a double replacement reaction a redox reaction, or is that something else? And so when we're thinking about double replacement, double replacement has the form AB plus CD. When we have an AB plus CD type reaction, what is the driving force for those types of reactions? One, if the product is a insoluble solid, it's precipitation. Two, gas formation. Three, stronger acid, weaker acid. Double replacement reactions are not redox reactions. You know, stronger oxidizes to weaker oxidizes, that's for redox reactions. Yeah, since we aren't dealing with a redox reaction, the driving force is different. The reactions are subclassified according to their driving force. And so this is, this is false. Stronger oxidizer and weaker oxidizer is driving force for redox reactions, not double replacement reactions. Two, metathesis reactions consist of favorable ion combinations. This is true. Metathesis, this, metathesis are like double replacement reactions without all the spectators. And so it's the net ionic equation. Net ionic equation is not double replacement. When I look at it, like um, silver ions, like fluoride ions, you know, there's a base of fluoride. It's not necessarily double replacement because we don't look at the spectators there. And so instead of calling double replacement, we can use this general term metathesis. Metathesis just means that the ions like each other. And so So something like this, silver ions plus chloride ions yield silver chloride. So this we call a metathesis. Does that look like a double replacement reaction to you? No, it doesn't fit the form. It's not an AB plus CD. Yeah. In lab, uh, we took uh, the silver ions, which going to come from silver nitrate. 
And then um, chloridines. Chloridines, we could have different sources for chloridines. So one source might be sodium chloride. We didn't use sodium chloride so, in lab yesterday. Do you know what we used as a source for chloridines yesterday? Hydrochloric acid. And so with hydrochloric, it doesn't matter if it's sodium chloride or hydrochloric acid. Both of them are going to yield chloridine. This is going to form silver chloride, solid plus. In this case, sodium nitrate. This would be the CE, and then we'll have the IE, which are silver ions, nitrate ions, a soluble salt. Sodium chloride is also a soluble salt. Sodium ions is chloride ions. So it's silver chloride solid plus sodium ions and nitrate ions. And then when we get rid of all the spectators, then we're left with the anion. And that is silver ions like chloride ions to precipitate silver chloride. And so this is a metathesis or a double replacement style reaction. So Number three, a mole of carbon 12 atoms weighs exactly 12 grams. Is that true? Oh. How much does a mole of carbon 12 atoms weigh? Um, that's to a decimal point. So it's like an approximate. Twelve point zero four or something. Um, this doesn't count. Um, if you look at carbon, here it says carbon 12.011. 12.011 is, what does 12.011 mean? Yeah, of all the isotopes of carbon. But one thing you have to know is carbon 12 is special. Why carbon 12 is special? Well, there are lots of different isotopes. Why is carbon 12 special? Carbon 13 is also isotope, but carbon 13 doesn't get that special category that carbon 12 does. What's special about carbon 12? It defines the yeah, um, carbon 12 is used in the definition of the atomic mass unit. What's the definition of the atomic mass unit? Yeah, I don't know, so I'm just going to do this all day. Uh, that's uh, where you get Avogadro's number from. Okay, the, well, there are two definitions. One is the definition of the mole, and the other is the definition of the atomic mass unit. The definition of the atomic mass unit is a carbon-12 atom weighs exactly 12 AMU. And then what they did was they chose Avogadro's number, the mole, so that you know um, they get 12 grams. Exactly 12 grams of carbon-12 would contain a mole of carbon-12 atoms. And the mole of carbon-12 atoms will weigh exactly Grams. So this is based on the definition of mole. Number three, it's true. It's true. We need a standard, and this is the standard that's used in the mole, and it's also the standard that's used in the ANU. Number four, if two grams of H2 is allowed to react with excess, this is supposed to be O2, not O1. And then um, two grams of water is produced. 
Is that true? So there might be two grams of hydrogen and I'll end up with two grams of water. No, that's not true. Um, because this is not the mass ratio. If this were the mass ratio, then it'd be true. Um, this is the mole ratio. And so two grams of hydrogen is one mole of hydrogen. And so one mole of hydrogen is going to produce one mole of water. Now because it's two to two ratio, two to two mole ratio. One mole of water doesn't weigh two grams. One mole of water weighs how much? Well, the molar mass of water is oxygen 16 grams, hydrogen is 2, so it's about 18 grams. And so 2 grams of hydrogen will produce 18 grams of water. So this is false. Five, the theoretical yield for a reaction was 98.3 grams. The amount actually obtained is 91.5 grams, so they lost a little bit. The percent yield is what? So if you had a 100% yield, then your actual yield would have been 98.3. If your theoretical is 98.3 and your actual is 98.3, that would be 100% yield. This is going to be less than 100%. Does it come out to you? Are you going to post this? Yeah. Is it 93.1? Yeah, 93.1. Sometimes you don't get every, you know, it's like it's too much hassle to get every single bit of stuff out of there. Okay, try it six, seven, eight, and uh, so see what you can get from those. We'll take a look at it in a minute. Six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, yeah, true. So pick the seven weak acids or weak electrolytes. That's true. Weak acids, weak bases. Some salt, some salt, heavy metal salt. Strong acids are strong electrolytes. Yeah. HF is completely ionized in water. So strong acids would be completely ionized in water. So is HF a strong acid? Or a weak acid. Yeah, HF is a weird one because you would think it's strong. You know, HI, HBR, UCL are strong, but HF is not. There are reasons for this, um, but <clears throat> we won't get into the results so, one more. So this is false. It's, it's partially ionized. HF is a weak acid. Weak acids are weak electrolytes, so weak electrolytes are partially ionized. In water. Nine, which of the following substances will precipitate from an aqueous solution? There are a lot of typos in this, sorry. An aqueous solution. So, sodium will not. So all sodium salts are soluble. Ammonium salts are all soluble. Potassium salts are all soluble. Copper is not. Copper, we have to look at the anion. So, carbonates, are those all soluble? Carbonates are mostly soluble except for insoluble, mostly insoluble. Carbonates, chromates, and phosphates are insoluble, except for group one and ammonia. So this is what we call an insoluble salt. Insoluble salts will precipitate from an aqueous solution. But lead, isn't lead an insoluble salt? Now we look at the anion. So acetates are acetates soluble or insoluble? Soluble. Yeah. Acetates. What else? Are soluble. Acetates. 
acetate. Permanent. Wait, are you going over the solubility yeah. levels? Okay, acetates. Acetates, chlorates, chlorates. and nitrates. Acetates, chlorates, and nitrates are all soluble. The only insoluble one would be B. In the combustion of methane, according to the equation, how many grams? So sorry. Mm -hmm. What was the answer for that one? B or E? B. In the combustion of methane, according to the equation, how many grams of water are formed during the combustion of 4.24 grams of methane? That should be grams. So this is this stoichiometry. Now, um, here, unfortunately, we have to calculate the molar masses ourselves. But some really common molar, actually, the molar masses that are um, useful to know carbon is 1201. Hydrogen at 101, oxygen at 16.00. Those are handy to know. So, methane, um, the whole mass is 404 from the hydrogen. So, methane's molar mass is going to be 1604 grams per mole. Or 1604 U from all cells. Water, you know, oxygen 16, two hydrogens for two, so water is going to be 16 over two. So, did you do the stoichiometry? Yeah, this is a standard grams of A to moles of A, moles of A to moles of B, moles of B to grams of B. This is standard stoichiometry. Problem. Phase to grams phase. Yeah, so we start off with grams of methane. Go from grams of methane to moles of methane. From moles of methane to moles of water. So one to two ratio here, or two to one ratio. From the moles of water to grams of water. What did you yeah, E. E. E's correct. It depends on how many rounds the molar mass is. It's like E's going to be the closest. Yes. Eleven is another stoichiometry problem because this one has an eighty-four point eight percent yield. So why don't you work on number eleven here? So it has an eighty-four point eight percent yield. That means eighty-four point eight grams actually yield. Over 100 grams theoretically yield. And the part of the problem is this um, must be used to reduce 197 grams of BCL5. So 197 grams of BCL5, that's going to be the actual yield. So that's a lot. 
an actual yield of 127 grams of PCL5. And so what that means is that uh, I have to make 100 grams in theory PCL5 for every 84.8 grams of actually yield. So you can lose some of it. You lose about 15%. And so the actual yield is that cancels that gives us the theoretical yield. So we'll just convert this into um, moles. So phosphorus, I don't have that one. Thirty point nine seven. Chlorine, I do have that one. Thirty five point four five. So we have five chlorine and one phosphorus. So five times thirty five point four five plus thirty point nine zero two oh eight point twenty two. And then it's a one to one mole ratio, one mole PCL three. For every one mole of PCL5. And then PCL3 is going to be 3 times 35.45 plus 30.97. So it's 137.32 grams per mole of PCL3. Okay, so what does that come out to? So, I want an actual yield of 127 grams for PCL5 times 100 divided by 84 grams. And so, if I want 127 grams, in theory, I'm going to have to make 149.7, about 150 grams of PCL5. So, I'm going to lose about 23 grams. Okay, divided by 208.22 times 137.32, So C would be the correct answer, All right, how about this one? The metabolism of glucose can be represented by the equation down here. Delta H equals minus 2.82 times 10 to the third kilojoules. Is this exothermic or endothermic? It's exothermic. Delta H negative is exothermic. So that means that we're going to release a glucose. How many grams of glucose must be metabolized to produce 282 kilojoules worth of energy? Did anybody get this one? 18 grams. We want 282 kilojoules, and this delta H is for the equation I've written. So we're going to get the 2.82 times 10 to the third kilojoules for every mole of glucose metabolite, for every six moles of oxygen consumed, for every six moles of CO2 produced, and for every six moles of water produced. <coughs> 
excuse me, so when we have a delta H like this, we can connect it to any of the reagents. In this case, if we want to connect it to glucose, the one mole glucose C6H for a little bit. For every 2,820 kilojoules released or produced. Here, I get rid of the negative sign. The negative tells us the direction. I'm not going to have a lot of negative grams of glucose. So rather than putting the negative out here, I'm just going to write the product, not a reactant. If it's a reactant, then it's endothermic, and I have to absorb that much heat. And then we have to figure out the molar mass of glucose. You know, six carbons, 12 hydrogens. Six oxygens is going to add up to 180.18 grams glucose or more. So if it's 180 or 18.01, 18.01. Okay, let's take a look at the next problem here. Visible light is a very small part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Is that true or false? Fourteen radio waves always move slower than gamma rays. Gamma rays are the slowest. Isn't it false? Because I don't know. But they all move at the same speed, it's just the wavelength is the Yes, that's correct. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's false. Radio waves move at the speed of light, and gamma rays move at the speed of light. Their frequencies are going to be quite a bit different, though. And the wavelengths are going to be quite a bit different. So 14 is false. Light, electromagnetic radiation, moves at the same speed, the speed of light. Sound waves are different, though. Sound waves are not light or electromagnetic radiation. Sound waves move a lot slower. Fifteen, within a, a continuous spectrum, there are regions of forbidden energy. If it's continuous, that means all energies are allowed. So in a continuous spectrum, well, this would be false. In a quantized spectrum, then this would be true, because quantized means you know, they're forbidden and they're allowed energy. Sixteen, incandescent light waves produce a wide spectrum. A line spectrum would be an example of a quantized spectrum. So we're going to be forbidden and allowed. The lines are the allowed energy. Everything else is forbidden. Please, this is wrong. Okay, it's either true or false. Is that true or false? Incandescent light bulbs make what kind of light? White light or white light? Yeah. Like for example, a hydrogen lamp that's purple, but a 
regular light bulb, it's white. If it's white, then that tells us all the colors of the rainbow are, are allowed. So it's true? It's true. Is that, is this only referring to the visible light bulb? Because it's not emitting all of the extra electronic no. Yeah. So, so what's the difference between incandescent and fluorescent? Are they pretty much the same? No. Fluorescent and fluorescent. Even, oh, well, let me get to the first one. Even in the infrared part, it's continuous. There are no lines in the infrared. And so when you look at the emission spectrum of a regular light bulb, the infrared is continuous. If you could heat it up to the ultraviolet, then it should be continuous there too. So let's take a look. When you look at the fluorescent lamps, this is quite a bit different. The spectrum looks quite a bit different. Let me see what this looks like. No, this is Um, spectrum is singular. I thought it should be spectra. Spectra is plural. Spectra of light bulb. This is pretty much continuous. It doesn't have the same intensity. Like this one's more intense in the red. This one's more intense in the blue. But still, nonetheless, it's going to appear white. It's going to give you different tones or moods. You know, this will be warmer white light. This will be cooler white light. You know. This is actually an LED. LED gives you a continuous spectrum like that. When you mix the red, green, and blue, LED gives you that white light. This is a fluorescent lamp. For, for fluorescent lamps, if you look, they're emitting the colors of the rainbow, but you know it's much more intense in certain regions. And so the light's not really going to look like sunlight. This looks like a halogen floodlight, which is very blue. Yeah. And it's how they um. How they make the light. I don't actually see the spectra. So the reason the spectras are different is because of um, what's used in them, like for yes. instance, tungsten or right. Fluorescent lamps um, generate. A plasma inside here. Plasma is going to be this exciting gas, and it can hit the inside surface of this, which makes it start to glow. You don't have to know how they operate. But you can tell them these are LEDs up here. And they used to be fluorescent lamps. For fluorescent lamps, the color spectrum is slightly different. Do you know they moved away from one type of lamp? Was what used to be in them? Or the fluorescent LED, what the difference were? I guess one is more energy efficient than the other. Yeah. All I need is the most energy efficient. Here's some stuff. So this is the solar spectrum here. The solar spectrum is going to produce infrared on the other side of red and ultraviolet on the other side of violet. And they cut it off. 
Even as daylight, this is an incandescent lamp. Incandescent lamp produces mostly red. As you get to higher and higher energy, intensity decreases. So. Here is a fluorescent lamp, which these colors are going to add up to white light, but it's going to definitely have a different feel to it than this. It's halogen. Halogen and incandescent pretty much the same. Halogen lamps last longer. What happens is some of the tungsten starts to vaporize, and the halogens help prevent that vaporization from occurring. So halogens are Halogen lamps are more stable over a longer period of time. We have cool white LEDs, a lot of blue here. So people who, who deal with LEDs, where they might wear blue blockers of glasses you know, to try to block the blue. Because blue and violet and ultraviolet are thought to cause eye damage. And the warm white LED is a very low intensity. Are they working on a way to get rid of those little mm -hmm. Yeah, LED monitors you can buy. Okay, we have a name for it. We had filtered out. Is it kind of like night mode? Yeah, night mode, exactly. They have eye saver mode or something like that. You can also get eye too. Yeah, so you can buy eye care mode. You know, this is just going to lower the intensity of the blue. This one has anti blue light. This is it's just a blue light filter. You can put it on top of your monitor. So incandescent and light bulbs produce a continuous spectrum, not line spectra. Line spectra are quantized. Incandescent is just your standard light bulb. 17, modern day scientists visualize electron orbiting the nucleus in a circular orbit. A true or false? False. That's false. They don't visualize orbits. What do they visualize? Sounds like orbits, but it's different. Yeah, the shape. What do you call those shapes? Yeah, they could be spherical. Kind of like as well. It comes back to the four hypothesis. Was Bohr correct? He was incorrect. Yeah. Bohr is most famous for orbits. Unfortunately, orbits are wrong. Instead of orbits, chemists think in terms of trying to visualize the electron, they think in terms of. Yeah, those clouds. What are those clouds called, though? <laughs> those shapes. Orbitals, yeah. <clears throat> Orbitals, if you have this kind of electron cloud. I know um, Google has the periodic table, mm -hmm. and it shows how the electrons are moving when they kind of start off. More like this, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden go this way. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think I know what you mean. The um, Google periodic table. Mm -hmm. The 
they show what's happening with electrons? Yeah. Um, yeah. Go to the actual. Um, starting like as yeah. force theory and then. Is that what it's talking about? No. no. These are still orbits. Yeah. Electrons are orbiting around here. Actually, these are shells. This is not correct. Yeah, nucleus is massive. Yeah, there's a problem with that. Okay. This is not the way you visualize it. And we visualize it a bit differently. I mean, it's a cool animation. So how are they behaving? Are they, like when you say clouds? Yeah, it's um, not. this one, there's a trajectory. You know, all electrons are on this, you know, it doesn't have to be, this is, these are planar orbits. This would be spherical orbit when it does this. These are, the orbit doesn't have, all the orbits don't have to be in the same plane. The orbits can be in different planes. But that's not the way we visualize it, though. This is taking it a step further. Because in Bohr, you know, we just have one electron, one orbit. You know, here we have multiple. And so what this is trying to represent is trying to represent the 2s, 2 first shell, and the 2p, 4 in the second shell. But in terms of probability, the electron doesn't have to be at this distance orbiting around the nucleus. The electron could be further away or closer to it. So modern day scientists visualize electrons in the orbitals. They don't orbit in orbitals. 18. Heisenberg uncertainty principle means we visualize the electron position as a cloud, a probability cloud. 19 came out wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Orbitals are the solutions to the, you know what equation? Orbitals are the solutions to the very famous equation in quantum mechanics. Schrodinger's equation. So orbitals are the solutions to Schrodinger's equation. Schrodinger's equation is back as well. Is it Schrodinger's? Schrodinger. Yeah, orbitals are the solutions to the Schrodinger equation, then that would be true. Twenty. When L equals one, we have the three P orbitals. When L equals one, are those P orbitals? Isn't now the shape is the probability distribution. So. Um. so if we have an n value. Then uh, we'll have L value as well. So let's pick an N value, um, five, for example. If N equals five, then L equals what? Okay. 
L equals all values from zero to a max of n minus one. When L equals zero, do you know what letter we give that? We call that L equals zero is going to be what type of orbital? It's an S. When L equals one, do you know what type of orbital that is? It's P. L equals two? P. L equals three? L equals four? Yeah, it just goes up alphabetical beyond this. So L equals four is going to be a G orbital. And M values are unique for each L. So M values go from plus to minus L, or minus to plus L. So this is going from minus zero to plus zero, so there's only one value here. But when L is equal to one, what are the three possible values for M? Minus one, zero, and one. Etc. And so there are three p orbitals, and so this is supposed to be true. When l equals one, we have the three p orbitals. There are five d orbitals. So what are the five d orbitals? Minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. It's five. When l equals three, we have the seven f orbitals. What are the seven f orbitals? Minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three. How many orbitals are there in the G? Nine. 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 N equals zero is the lowest energy level. What is the lowest energy orbital that you know? It's the S. Is it the zero S? Is that the lowest energy? Or is it the one S orbital? That's the lowest energy. The zero S or the one S? It turns out it is the one S. There's no such thing as the zero S. And that's because N can take on all values from one to infinity. All integer values from one to infinity. So it's false because I'm mixed equals zero s. Yes. So n equals zero is the lowest energy level. False. N equals one is the lowest energy level. And the lowest energy orbital is the one s orbital. 22, 2D orbital by the quantum mechanic because L is too small. <coughs> no. no, L is too big. Yes, when we're dealing with a D orbital, L is equal to 2. The maximum L value that we can have is N minus 1. So if N is equal to 2, the maximum L value we can have is 2 minus 1, which is 1. And so, 2p orbitals will stop there. You're not going to see 2p orbitals, 2f orbitals, 2p orbitals. The L value is too big, too high. That would both violate the Schrodinger equation. So, this is false. It's too big. Twenty-three. The electron configuration for chromium is argon four s two three d four. Yeah, chromium is the weird one. And so, what is the correct electron configuration? The correct electron configuration of chromium is 4s1, 3d5. So the R on 4s1, 3d5. So this is supposed to be true or false. The answer for this one is false. 
What is the argon for S1? Argon for S1, 3D5. Let me jump ahead there. <laughs> Number 40. Draw a detailed global energy level diagram for chromium. Can you draw the, the orbital energy level diagram? Um, you don't have to fill it in with electrons. This, let me see how people draw it. Sure. Yeah, moving up like that. One has to do I have, you know, I have some things that I like. Uh, this is for chromium, but just draw. Uh, how about? So, do you guys remember this pyramid? Mm -hmm. This pyramid shows us the max L values here. So, for example, if n is equal to one, the max L would be one, n minus one, one minus one is zero. So we only have one value. We can't have one. So there's no such thing as a one p orbital. It would exceed our max L value. When n equals 2, we're allowed all values from 0 up to a max of n minus 1. 2 minus 1 is 1. So 2 p's as high as we're going to get here. When n equals 3, then l equals 2 is going to be the highest. But we're going to have all values 0, 1, 2. And so this is the basic structure of the pyramid. But with the pyramid, um, we can see what the shells are because each shell begins with an S. So this is the first shell because as we go across, we hit 2s, that's the next shell. So the next shell is going to conclude the 2s and the 2p, and then we hit the 3s. The 3s begins the third shell. So the third shell is going to have 3s, and then 3p, and then it hits 4s. So that would be the third shell. The fourth shell is going to have 4s. 3d, and then 4p, and then we get to 5s. 5s would be the fifth shell. What would the fifth shell have in it? 5s, 4d, 5p. Yeah. 5s, 4d, 5p, and then it goes to 6s. And so this is how we figure out the shells. And so... Um, <laughs> What I'm looking for in the drawing is this, basically. The lowest energy orbital is going to be 1s. And then there's a big jump to 2s. This is the next shell. And then there's a small jump to 2p. And then another bigger jump to 3s. And a small jump to 3p. But these jumps are becoming um, smaller and smaller as you go along. So the fourth shell just consists of the 4s, 3d, 4p. The, the 3D should clearly be shown at higher energy than the 4 One of the most common mistakes is that people don't show that when they're drawn. Does it matter if we have the 4P there compared to another side of 3D as long as it's higher? Yeah, as long as it's higher, it doesn't matter. It could be over here. 
But what they're doing is what they're doing here is they're dividing it. These are L equals zero. These orbitals are the L equals one or the P orbital. These orbitals are the L equals two or the D orbitals. And so they're splitting it according to L, like we did over here. So or the S orbital um, here, and the P orbitals, and the D orbitals, etc. So yeah, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you could write the P's over here as long as it's higher than it is. Yeah. But this has additional. Were you able to label the orbitals with N, L, and M? Mm -hmm. All right. Tell me the N and L and M. Yeah, so that's a convenient thing here. <coughs> These, the two Bs. Yeah. Okay, that's good. All right, now fill this with the electrons for chromium. Hans rule state orbitals of the same energy should be filled singly with parallel spin. Is that true or false? Well, when you're filling the p orbitals, should you fill them two at a time or one at a time? And do you fill them with the same spin or opposing? So this is true. The electron configuration for the fluorinine is helium 2s2 2p6. Is it true or false? Fluorine is a 1s2, 2s2, 2p, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2p5. That would be fluorine. But this is fluoride. Fluoride has an extra electron, so it will be an ice electron with a neon, but it has the same number of electrons as neon, 10 electrons. So that would be 2s2, 2p, I mean uh, 1s2. 2s2, 2p6. And so actually that is true. Right? This is true. This is for the fluoride ion. 26 tungsten is xenon, 6s2, 5d4. For tungsten, we'd look at the periodic table for this. Tungsten is W. Here, W4. So if we go back, it is xenon. It's xenon, and then what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six. It's in the six shell. So it'd be 6s1, 6s2. Six, six and then for this particular table, 57 would be here in the 3, 4, 5D, so 6S2, 5D, 1. And then we go to 58 here. This is a 4S, 14. And then 5D, an additional 3, so it's 5D, 4. 
And so when I look at this over here, I'm missing a set of orbitals. I'm missing the 4f orbitals. So it should go 6s to 4f by b. So this is false. This is supposed to be true or false. False. Which bond is most polar? So sorry, what is it? It's Z, excuse me, it's um, xenon 6s2. Yeah. Um, but then we can use the periodic table to help us with this. Take a look at it. Just use the Google periodic table here. So Zeton takes us to 54 electrons. Tungsten has 74 electrons. So if we go to xenon, xenon has 54 electrons. Where does electron 55 go? The electron 55 is here. And that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This would be 6s. So 55 and 56 would still open in 6s. So this would be 6s too. And then where do we go? 57 would be, this is 3D, 4D, 5D. 57 would be 5D1. And then 58 through 71 would be 4F, 14. I didn't do too many of these. Right? And then the 72 would be here. We're back in 5D. So this is 5D1, 5D2, 5D3. And so we'll go back to 5D. So what we'll do is we'll um, rewrite this. So this is going to be xenon 6s2, 4f. 14, 5D, we'll combine the 5D, 5D4. This is the downward pulse. I don't know why you're going to look at the truth. Yeah. Um, tungsten is one electron shy of half filling. Yeah. So if we do 6S1, 5D5, then it would be like chromium. It would be half filled. Except when we get to um, have bigger elements like this, bigger orbitals, it's not going to be as significant. So let's take a look at the electron configuration for tungsten here. Tungsten, you'd expect to be similar to chromium. The 4F is filled, but the 5D is just shot one electron shy of half filled. And so you'd expect to promote a 6S to a 5D, so it'd be 5D5, 6S1. But it doesn't do that. And so this higher up is where we're going to see the primary description. This one is just normal. Does it matter the order? Like, they have it written as 4F, 5B, 6S. They put it in numerical order. In terms of filling order, it does matter. In terms of filling order, you fill the 5S first. Oh, actually, let's go to 6S. 6S. So, um, the next shell begins with an M. 
So if you go to n equals 6, that's 6f, six 6p, six 6p, six 6f, six 6p, six and 6h. Those will be all the allowed totals. And so when we fill this, we fill the 6s first, followed by the 4f, followed by the 5d, and the 6p. That's going to end our shell. And so in the 6 shell, we have 6s, 4f, 5d, 6p. So in the 6 shell, we have 6s, 4f, 5d, 6p. And then we go to the seventh shell. And so this is in terms of filling order. In terms of leaving order, it's the highest end that leaves. So in terms of leaving, we can do it like this. Xenon, and then we'll have 4F14. 5D, 4, 6S, 2. The first electrons to leave the atom are going to be the 6S. So we start off with the highest N. So that's why it's numerical. First electrons to leave are going to be the 6S, followed by the 5D, followed by the 4S. The charge on the alkaline earth ions is plus two. Plus two. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. Which bond is most polar? HCL? It turns out that HCl is not the most polar. Um, the th what are the three most electronegative elements? Fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. Chlorine does have high electronegativity, but it's a bigger atom. You have one more shell of electrons. Because of the size, it, it's not quite as electronegative. You would think it'd be tied for oxygen, but it's not. And so the hydrogen oxygen bond is the most polar. The three most electronegative elements fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. Number 28, the charge on the alkaline earth ions is plus two. 29, noble gases are highly reactive. False. The bond between a metal and a non-metal is likely to be non-polar covalent, polar covalent, ionic, or metallic. Ionic. What is the predicted bond angle in CO2? Yeah, straight line, 180. 32 I haven't really talked about. Strong bases ionize in water. Yeah, they hydrolyze. So this is likely false. 33, what is the predicted bond angle in H2O? Not 120. 180. Not 180. Oh, 109. 109. Two lone pairs on oxygen. So four groups. Four groups is 109. But it's bad than 109. 34, what is the prediction bonding on SO2? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be the same angle there. SO2, you have to draw the Lewis structure for this. It turns out they're a lone pair, a lone pair on sulfur.
So what's the bond angle for this up to? 120, 120 square. What is the shape of NH3? Yes. Pyramidal. 36. CF4 is a polar molecule. That's the problem. CF4 is non-polar. Tetrahedral, the dipoles will cancel each other out. 37. H2O is a polar molecule. Yeah, it is polar. So, those are some examples of some more multiple choice questions you may encounter. Also, on the final, you might have some equations to write out. So, your magnesium carbonate and hydrochloric acid. This would be a double replacement reaction. And so I would want the C, D, the I, D, and the N, I, D. Also the driving force. Another one, lead to acetate and sodium sulfate. Mm -hmm. The complete equation with the driving force, the ionic equation, and the net ionic equation. This is kind of what I'm asking from chapter um, experiments six and seven. If we look at 41 here, draw the Lewis structure for bicarbonate. Also include one 3D drawing, electron geometry, molecular geometry, Ooh. resonance form. I know that's going to be a bonus question. It's an actual question. It's not a bonus. What is this? Thirty-nine is more stoichiometry. Let's skip that for right now. So this gives you an idea. Um, well, I have another one to go through later. Another practice. Yeah. But uh, we'll cover it a little bit later because I haven't gotten to those topics yet. So we stopped at chapter fifteen, right? Yeah. Do you know where in chapter 15 we come? We looked at the property of liquids. What are some of the properties of liquids? One, vapor pressure. Do you recall where it left off last time? No. I think we were still practicing that as like the Dalton's law. The wet oxygen and stuff like that. Okay. Mm. Isn't Dalton and Avogadro's law just based on the preference how you want to solve? Yeah. Yeah. I think we finished that, didn't we?
Um, this chapter, chapter 15, deals mainly with solids, liquids, and gases. And it, it went in reverse order. So first we looked at gases and gas mixtures. But if we have a solid, the particles are pretty much stuck together in a solid. They can be in an orderly pattern like this or a disordered pattern, which would be um, amorphous. But whatever it is, the forces that hold the particles together will be stronger than the kinetic energy. The particles, um, they could be anywhere from molecules to ions to whatever forces holding together are going to be greater than the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is going to try to break things apart. For liquids, the forces are comparable to the kinetic energy. And then for gases, the forces holding it together are weaker than the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy can <clears throat> simply be bright, for example. So uh, if you have a solid at room temperature versus a liquid at room temperature, the solids are going to be more strongly bonded together, the particles. They don't have to be bonds. They could also be what we call intermolecular forces. Of attraction. But they can be bonds. So we have chemical bonds. If there's a bond, then it can be an ionic bond or a covalent bond. It could be an intermolecular force, IMF. Intermolecular force can hold things together. We'll talk more in more detail about that. And so let's take a look at some solids now. Solids. So if the solid is a somewhat disorganized, you know, it's hard to predict where the next carbon is. The next carbon could be over here or over there. Then we call it amorphous. If it's very well ordered, then we call it crystalline. So the next sodium would be over here, the next carbon would be over here. So we can predict based on the structure. Aluminum is a crystalline solid. Silicon is a crystalline solid, so we can see. This is a sodium chloride salt. This is silicon. This is plastic. Plastic is what we call a polymer. Polymers consist of monomers, which is a PDMEA. So PDMEA would be the monomer, and polymer would be the gas, a bunch of these together. That would be the polyethylene. You can see that underlying structure when you try to fracture like crystals. When you fracture a clean crystals like this, they break off in clean layers. Over here, though, if you, if you do the same thing with glass, um, it doesn't cleave like crystals do. It fractures, and it fractures in a more random 
pattern. His glasses are remarkable. Everything with ceramics. Ceramics, for the most part, are, are crystalline. I mean, it's hard, but they're hard to break ceramics because the bonds are so stiff. And so the first part of the solids is uh, recognizing the difference between crystalline and amorphous. Amorphous is going to have enough disorder here that it will be hard to predict where the, the next position will be. We can get an idea of the forces that hold these things together by melting point. So the higher the melting point of a solid, the more strong the bond So if we look at ionic solids, which is the ionically bounded ion, like sodium chloride, calcium carbonate, silver chloride, ammonium bromide. Those have strong, fairly strong ionic bonds, which results in high melting point. It's hard to melt sodium chloride. When we melt it, we have to break it apart. Not completely, we have to break it apart so that there's translational motion. That's sodium chloride. Calcium carbonate looks like this with the trigonal planar carbonate on it. This would be lead 2 sulfide or galena with lead ore. If we have molecular crystals, molecular crystals are going to have a much higher melting point. In other words, molecular crystals are a lot easier to melt. They're also typically characterized by soft um, and easy to break apart. Like ice, ice is soft and easy to break apart. This is sulfur. Sulfur is a molecular solid. It consists of a whole bunch of sulfur molecules that are stuck to one another. Then we have covalent network solids. Covalent network solids would be like diamond. There's a lattice of carbon-carbon covalent bonds. Quartz, the lattice of silicon oxygen bonds. Covalent network solids have very high melting point. So the melting point of quartz is about 1700 degrees C. The melting point of diamond is 3500 degrees C, so extremely high melting point. So here are some quartz derivative, quartz and quartz derivative, strong bond. We also have metallic crystals that are held together by metallic, metallic bonds. For um, metallic crystals, sometimes the bonds are very strong, giving a high melting point, like platinum and gold. Gold has an extremely high melting point. Sometimes the bonds are fairly weak, like sodium. And so here's a summary of the types of solids that we have. We have solids that contain ionic bonds, those are ionic solids. Ionic solids are going to have high melting points because ionic solids are strong. In general, these are water soluble, like KNO3 nitrate salts are soluble, sodium salts are soluble. However, MgO is insoluble. And it has to do with its stronger ionic bonds. We have molecular solids like ice. Ice is low melting. They're usually soluble, more soluble in, in organic solvents if they're non-polar. Like this one's non-polar, this one's non-polar. Or water if they're polar. We have network covalent solids like quartz and diamond. Very high melting point. And these don't dissolve. In water. And then some metallic solids like copper and iron. They're going to display a wide range of melting points. 
they're malleable at that point. So I jumped ahead, and I'm going to go back now and let's take a look at the properties of liquids. Liquids are going to have translational motion. One of the biggest differences between liquids and gas, liquids are non-compressible. Because liquid particles are touching one another. Whereas gases can be compressed because gases consist mostly of empty space. Likewise, gases can be expanded, liquids cannot. Gases have low density, liquids have relatively high density. Gases may be mixed in a fixed volume, liquids cannot. So, uh, gases exert constant pressure on the wall of the container. Liquids, the greatest pressure is at the bottom of the container. Okay, when we're looking at liquids, we, we think about the stick togetherness of liquid. You know, what's holding the particles of liquid together? And so, whatever is holding the particles together is the force. And, um, we have enough kinetic energy to disrupt that. And so we call this the stick togetherness, or how sticky the particles are. So viscosity is one of those two. So we'll just look at this down the list. Vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is how easy does the liquid vaporize. If the liquid vaporizes easily, we call it volatile. So volatile liquid evaporate or vaporize readily. Non-volatile liquids don't vaporize so easily. And so it depends on the forces that hold the particles together in a liquid. The stronger the force is, the less volatile, the lower the vapor pressure. So here we can see water molecules. Water molecules are held together by intermolecular forces. There's no bond between the water molecules. There's just attraction. The stronger the attractions, the fewer molecules are vaporized here. The weaker the attractions, the more molecules are vaporized. So likewise, temperature is going to have an impact. The higher the temperature, the more molecules vaporize. The lower the temperature, the fewer molecules are vaporized. Some of the properties. One is the vapor pressure. <clears throat> so the stronger the IMFs, the intermolecular forces that are holding the particles together, the lower the vapor pressure. Because uh, fewer and fewer molecules can actually vaporize. The key to vaporization is the amount of energy required. The key to vaporization, the stronger the IMF, you know, what's holding the particles together, the higher the heat of vaporization, the harder it is, the more energy. Mm -hmm. 
the opposite of vaporization is condensation. We'll talk about that. The boiling point is um, when the liquid is converted to the gas spontaneously. And it's the temperature at which water, or at which the liquid boils. The boiling point equals the temperature at which liquid boils. Boiling occurs when the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. And so we have the normal boiling point. And the normal boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to one atmosphere, normal atmosphere pressure. And so one way of thinking about this is this is going to be some vaporization occurring at the surface. The hotter the temperature, the more vaporization. And therefore, the hotter the, um, the greater the vapor pressure. And so if I keep increasing the temperature, uh, eventually I'll reach a point where the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. When that happens, boiling occurs. But the atmospheric pressure varies. And so water boils at different temperatures depending on what the atmospheric pressure is. At high elevations, the atmospheric pressure is lower. And so water boils at a lower temperature at higher elevations. And at higher elevations, you need to cook things longer because you're dealing with lower temperatures than at lower elevations. It has nothing to do with the pressure. Hmm? You said um, water boils at a lower temperature for high altitudes. Yeah. That's because of the pressure? Yes. And the variable pressure changes with temperature as well as the intermolecular forces. So let's take a more detailed look at the vapor pressure. Let's say I have water at 25 degrees C. Do you recognize this curve? This curve? You know what this curve is called? Kind of looks like it. This curve is called a temperature distribution or thermal distribution. And they call it the kinetic energy distribution curve for a liquid at a given temperature. And so if this is 25 degrees C, on the y-axis is a population. On the x-axis is the energy. And so if I have a sample of water at 25 degrees C, are all the water molecules moving in exactly the same manner? That is, if I have a cup of water, do all the water molecules move at the same speed, the same direction, or is it more random? It, it's more random. In fact, the water molecules are just moving around. The sample temperature is 25 degrees C, so when we put a thermometer in here, we, will, we measure 25 degrees C, but that measurement, the 25 degrees C, is related to the average kinetic energy. That average kinetic energy comes from individual kinetic energies averaged out. And so some water molecules move slow, 
they have low kinetic energy. Some water molecules move fast, they have high kinetic energy, but the average is going to be somewhere here on the shoulder because this is kind of a normal distribution, but it has a tail here. Um, it's not called a normal distribution. This distribution is called a uh, maximal Boltzmann distribution. Let's take a look. This is uh, this says uh, population. This is the energy here. And so let's say red is room temperature. If I increase the temperature, it shifts the whole population to the right. And so the green would be at temperature is greater. If I decrease the temperature, it shifts the population to the left. Now the population doesn't change here. And so the area under the curve is the same. The area under the curve would be related to the population. And so we can see how that shifts it. So lower temperature and the average kinetic energy is somewhere on the shoulder here. And that would give us some temperature. And there's room temperature, and there's temperatures above room temperature. Okay, what's Also found here is this E. This E is the energy cutoff required for vaporization. If the molecules are really sticky, then it requires higher energy to vaporize. If the molecules aren't so sticky, then it requires lower energy to vaporize. And so there are two things that we look at in the Baxter Boltzmann curve like this. One, is what is that minimum energy required to vaporize? And that's going to change depending on how sticky they are. How sticky they are depends on the intermolecular forces. So the stronger the intermolecular forces of attraction, the more sticky the molecules are, and the harder it is to vaporize. That's why the vaporization pressure goes down. That's why the stronger the intermolecular forces, the heat of vaporization, how much energy you have to add to vaporize, it goes up. And so where E lies, this depends on how the IMFs are in relation. So let's say it costs this much energy to vaporize. Well, that means the population that can vaporize is just this, the shaded here. All these, the unshaded area, don't have enough energy to vaporize. And so none of these molecules would vaporize at this speed. Temperature is going to impact the number of the vaporized. So increasing temperature is going to increase the vapor pressure because it shifts the whole thing to the right, which is going to give us a higher population and the higher energy particle. So we look at boiling point, we're going to look at viscosity next. And viscosity is resistance to flow. If the molecules are really sticky, then it doesn't flow very well. We call it viscous liquid. Like molasses, uh, what is this? Honey. Honey has a high viscosity. You can see the resistance of flow compared to water. Water would have a much lower viscosity flow in the future. And so that's going to depend on the IMF. The stronger the IMF, Be higher than boiling point. The stronger the IMF, the higher the 
it's got to do. Maybe I'm more resistant as well. One more property, we'll look at it, surface tension. These are all very qualitative. We can be quantitative with numbers, but we are. Surface tension is the, um, how difficult it is to break apart the molecules here on the surface. There are different ways we can visualize this. One way is, is this, um, you know, it, if we have something that's more dense than water, it should sink. And so this water body should sink because it's more dense than water, but it doesn't. It doesn't sink because of surface tension of water. So there are other ideas behind this as well. Another idea behind this is that they're unlike. So, for example, the lakes are very non porous. Water is very porous. You don't like each other. Non polar lake and polar water. The other is breaking the surface. When you break the surface, you increase the number of surface molecules. Surface molecules aren't as stable as bulk molecules. When you look at the surface molecules, the surface molecules are just held to the liquid just by the ones underneath and around it. Whereas an interior molecule is held in there by a full sphere of molecules, 360 degrees. But surface molecules just have this half sphere of molecules holding them together. And so surface molecules are higher in energy, less stable. To break the surface, that is to increase the surface area, we have to create more surface molecules. More surface molecules means higher energy. Higher energy is not as favorable as going to lower energy. And so that's surface tension. So when it comes to surface tension, you know, there's like a lizard that can run on water. Is that because of the speed it's going? Yeah, there are different ideas for yeah. this. The bug, they're looking at the bug in more detail, this bug. Why can this bug run on water? So, um, there's some recent studies on the echo. Like, why doesn't it fall off? How, how is it sticking on the sticking on there? And how did gecko stick on the ceiling? And so they did some studies on geckos. You know, uh, and what's the uh, this isn't from chemical engineering used. Right? So they studied the gecko feet here. And what they found was this. Um, no, this is not really moving good. There we go. Okay. Robert J. Full, a uh, biology professor at UC Berkeley, and their colleague tested adhesion of gecko toes to strongly hydrophobic. Hydrophobic means it doesn't like water, yeah. and hydrophilic, it likes water. 
Gecko toes, which are highly hydrophobic, are covered with millions of tiny hairs, each tipped with hundreds of projections known as spatulae. And so it turns out that um, what hold geckos on the ceiling and walls are the stickiness of these, the intermolecular forces. And the stickiness comes from these branch hairs that are nonpolar. And so they like nonpolar things. So geckos might have a hard time with water. The other thing is the buoyancy of ducks. Duck feathers are hydrophobic, and so they don't like water. Like, what actually makes water roll off ducks' back? Or ducks hydrophobic? Are ducks waterproof or water resistant? Why do duck feathers repel water? And so, hydrophobic duck feathers and their simulation of pink salt substrate. So, a lot of research has gone into this. This is a branch of chemistry um, you know, of material science. And so, when I was at um, UCSB, these are the types of things that people were interested in. This and abalone shells. You know, abalone shells are incredibly tough. Hard to break. I wonder if I want to put people in the kind of brain color out of that size. Yeah. That would probably work pretty well. And so it de de deals down to these intermolecular forces. In fact, um, so this doesn't have the images. This would have the images. Uh, they had an image of a gecko clinging to the ceiling. There you go. And so the the sticky, but not in the sense that you normally think. You know, when you're thinking about sticky, like glue molasses or something like that. It's sticking in a different way. And so when we look at the intermolecular forces, IMFs, intermolecular forces, these are the forces that hold molecules or particles together. But these aren't bonds. The forces that can hold the particles together are, well, we looked at the bonds already. We had the ionic bonds. Those are very strong. And then we had the covalent bonds. They're also very strong. And then we had the metallic bonds. Those can be strong to weak. And then we had the intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are typically what holds molecules together. And so when we're looking at solids, we have the ionic solids, the covalent solids, metallic solids and molecular solids. For the molecular solids, it's primarily the IMFs that hold things together. Typically, these are weak. So an example of ionic would be like magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide has a melting point over 2,000 degrees Celsius. Or if we go to a covalent, like diamond, you know, Diamond has a melting point of 3,500 degrees Celsius. Or metals. Gold, you know what the melting point of gold is? Melting point of gold is 3,000 degrees, over 3,000 degrees Celsius. Gold has a very high melting point. Where some of the other metals melt very low temperatures, like lithium and metal, does melt at very low temperatures. So, so like a diamond? Mm -hmm. It's hard to break because of the strong covalent bond. But if you look at graphite from pencil, you know it's 
still carbon, but it could easily break because of Well, um, graphite's a composite material. There are two. Um, graphite is a combination of covalent and molecular. And graphite forms these sheets, benzene ring-like sheets. And these sheets are very hard to break. <clears throat> this is why they could use graphite in like high pressure lubricant applications, high pressure, because you don't crush these sheets. But these sheets are held together by IMFs. There are no bonds holding the sheets together, so the sheets can slide one on top of each other. And it doesn't take much energy to get the sheets sliding. And so graphite contains covalent bonds and then IMFs. The IMFs hold the sheets together. And that's not a real bond. IMFs are typically weaker than real bonds. And so examples of molecular solids would be like ice. You know, ice melts at zero degrees C. Gold melts at 3,000 degrees C. So the forces that hold water molecules together in solid ice are weak. Graphite is very hard to melt. Because to melt graphite, you'd have to break all these covalent bonds. And so the melting point of graphite, you know, what happens is they get so hot, it just starts to vaporize rather than, rather than melt. And so there's no way to form molten graphite. So these intermolecular forces of uh, um, are going to be important in understanding different things. You know, it used to be thought before the hypothesis of this, you know, the hairs and the hydrophobic, hydrophobic, you know, light dissolves light, so hydrophobic light is hydrophobic. So geckos are gonna have a hard time gripping on the glass. Can they grip on the glass? No, no. Maybe if it's cold. I don't know why, but my hand is cold. Yeah, maybe, or maybe they don't. You know, overall, the intermolecular forces can be quite strong. We'll, we'll look into those some, some more. But um, let's look at the types. Of in intermolecular forces. And that will give us an idea, or some idea of the strength of these intermolecular forces. So, you know, water molecules don't weigh anything. If you had a single water molecule, how much does a single water molecule weigh on average? A single water molecule on average weighs 18 U. 18 atomic mass units is nothing. So if you were to blow on the surface of ice, will all the water molecules just vaporize off? No, they aren't gonna vaporize off because they're stuck together, they're sticky. And so um, that's what's holding them together. And, uh, now, when we look at the types of intermolecular forces, um, there are three types of intermolecular forces that are discussed, but there are more than three types. The three types of intermolecular forces that are discussed here are one, dipole forces, two, induced dipole forces, and three, hydrogen bonds. The dipole forces are going to um, have an electrical attraction between um, dipoles. Dipoles are going to be areas of positive charge, so we have a delta plus and a delta minus. So one way of showing a dipole is to do it like this. The other way of doing it is by drawing an arrow 
for the positive tail. And so we, we know unlike charges attract. And so if I have two HCLs, they're going to be stuck to one another. If I can align the negative end of one to the positive end of the other. Like this. So in a dipole force, I'm going to have the positive hydrogen and the negative chlorine attracting one another. And so this is going to hold these two molecules together, a negative chlorine attracting the positive. And so these are dipole forces. Um, HCl is normally a gas at room temperature, so these dipole forces aren't so strong. It's not like, you know, HCl is a very low um, melting point and a very low boiling point. But nonetheless, you can liquefy HCl. When you have liquid or molten, um, not molten, liquid HCl, then the molecules are being held together by these electrical attractions. Two is the induced dipole. So one thing about uh, the dipole forces here, these are the permanent dipoles. If I had chlorine, there's no permanent dipole here. If chlorine gets in a tug of war with another chlorine, it's going to be a tie. Whereas if chlorine gets in a tug of war with hydrogen, chlorine is going to win. So this is what's going to set up the dipole here. Sets up the dipole as this polarization of the electron cloud, the bonding electron pair. Over in here, it's a tie, so the electron cloud looks very symmetric. It's not asymmetric, and so it's just spread out evenly. Yeah. The chlorine can be liquefied. We can make liquid chlorine. What's holding the liquid chlorine molecules together? Is it gravity? Is that what holds? No, gravity, these things weigh next to nothing. And so they got to stick together. It's like water. It's not gravity that's holding water together. The water is held together in, in space, you know. Um, and so if something's holding the chlorine together, what's holding the chlorine together is something called an instantaneous <coughs> induced dipole. Because there's no permanent dipole here. It's a nonpolar molecule. So, as far as the instantaneous induced dipole, what happens is they're law of electrons. You know, um, each chlorine has 17 electrons. So there's 17 total electrons here and 17 total electrons here. That gives us a total of 34 electrons total. This is not valence electrons, this is a total of electrons, including the core electron. And so we have 34 electrons total. What we expect for chlorine is we expect the electron to be evenly distributed. Yeah. And, and so 17 on the left should be evenly distributed and 17 on the right should be evenly distributed. But the electrons are moving and it's hard to pinpoint where the electrons are. And so let's say I have chlorine and chlorine here. Let's say I have more electrons build up on the left you know, in just one instant of time. And so one instant of time, I have more electrons build up on the left and fewer electrons on the right. And so in one instant of time, it could be polarized. That is, I could have more electrons on the left and fewer on the right. If that's the case, then I build up a negative charge on the left and a positive charge on the right, because now the distribution's no longer even. 
the distribution has been skewed. But that's not stable. And so in the next instant of time, this should just disappear because you know, we shouldn't build up too much electron cloud on the left. In fact, um, so this, this should, um, this instantaneous polarization, that is this instantaneous dipole that's generated is short-lived. But the instantaneous dipole is lived long enough so that <laughs> what happens is if we have another chlorine next to it, it induces a dipole here. So this other chlorine will have an even electron distribution here, but if the other chlorine sees a positive charge here, then all the electrons, all 34 electrons, will try to migrate left. They'll try to migrate left because of the positive charge here they're going to be attracted to. And so what that means is that it's going to induce the dipole here. And so we'll get more charge build up over here. And so we, we end up with is an instantaneous induced dipole. The two chlorine molecules will attract one another. And this attractive force is not a, called a dipole force. It's called an induced dipole force, one, or a London force. London or instantaneous induced. <coughs> dipole or this induced dipole for sure. It doesn't last for very long. It doesn't last for a moment in time. And so one instant in time, the electron cloud is slightly polarized because electrons are just moving around. And in that one instant in time, there'll be attraction and then it disappears. We're back to non-polar. But in the next instant of time, you can polarize again. These are present in all species with electrons. So, it could have a permanent dipole, like HCl has a permanent dipole. But what can happen is, you know, HCl's permanent dipole looks like this. You average over time. The chlorine is more electronegative, so it pulls electron cloud closer to it. We'll have delta minus and delta plus here. But what can happen in one instant of time is, in one instant, over time, this dipole can grow. That is, let's say more electrons migrate to the right. If more electrons migrate to the right, then this instantaneous dipole can be even bigger. Okay. More polarized. It's, it's not sustainable you know, over the long run, but in one instant, we'll see it. And so in one instant of time, the delta minus and the delta plus grow because of this. And that's going to create a bigger dipole. A bigger dipole means higher charge. Higher charge means stronger attraction. In the next instant of time, it can grow even weaker. You know, uh, that is, it can be less polar. So the electrons might migrate to the left. And so if that's the case, then the dipole shrinks. So this delta minus and delta plus would be much smaller. So we'll get a smaller dipole. A smaller dipole means weaker attraction. A bigger dipole means stronger attraction. But overall, we'll see a net attraction. Okay. 
So this is present in all species with electrons. So if we have electrons, this is going to, the electrons are moving. This is going to be happening. Whether there's a permanent dipole, like this, or an instantaneous dipole. The more electrons there are, the bigger the instantaneous dipole that can result. The more electrons, the bigger the instantaneous dipole that can result. And so if I look at HCl, Chlorine has 17 electrons. If I look at HI, iodine has how many electrons? 53 electrons. So if you have 53 electrons, then the instantaneous dipole that can be generated with 53 electrons are going to be much larger than the instantaneous dipole that you can generate with 17 electrons. And so the instantaneous induced dipole attractions are going to be much stronger in HI than in HCl. And um, when we look at HCl, HCl has a bigger permanent dipole. HI has a smaller permanent dipole. But since HCl has fewer electrons, it doesn't fluctuate as much. So the dipole can shrink or it can grow bigger. This would be the instantaneous dipole. But when we compare it to HI, even though it has a smaller permanent dipole, its instantaneous dipole can be actually much larger. Because let's say all 53 electrons move to the right. Then what we're going to see is much bigger instantaneous dipoles here. Because of this, um, what we're going to see is that HI actually has a higher boiling point than HCl. In other words, you know, the liquid um, is stuck together more. It's stickier. HI is stickier even though it has a smaller permanent dipole. And smaller dipole means smaller charges. Smaller charges means weaker. But when we look at an instantaneous dipole, it could be much deeper. I mean, much, much larger. And so we consider both. And so for something like HCL and HI, for something like CO2, we only look at instantaneous induced because there's no permanent dipole. N2 and CL have about the same number of electrons. <coughs> N2 has how many electrons? Well, each nitrogen has seven electrons total. This is not failing. When we do instantaneous dipoles, we have to look at the total number of electrons. <coughs> And so if each nitrogen has seven, that's seven times two, it's 14 electrons, right? And then we look at carbon. Carbon has uh, six electrons. Oxygen has eight electrons. So six and eight electrons makes 14 electrons. So both of these have 14 electrons. If both of these have 14 electrons, then the instantaneous induced dipole will be similar for both. In other words, um, based on instantaneous dipoles, they, they should be the same stickiness. However, um, carbon monoxide has a permanent dipole, and nitrogen does not. And since carbon monoxide has a permanent dipole, it's going to be a little bit stickier. A little bit. And so when we look at the boiling point, the boiling point of nitrogen is minus 196. It's very low. These are very weak. And the boiling point of carbon monoxide is 4 degrees higher, minus 192. So it's 4 degrees higher. 
for having the permanent dipole in addition to the instantaneous dipole. SiH4, silicon tetrahydride or silane. PH3, phosphorus tetrahydride. SiH4 is tetrahedral, tetrahedral nonpolar. PH3 is trigonal, terminal, like ammonia. These both have the same number of electrons. Since they both have the same number of electrons, the instantaneous induced dipole forces should be similar. In other words, London forces should be similar. However, pH3 is polar because it's trigonal or middle. SiH4 is nonpolar because it's tetrahedral. And so here we see a difference in boiling point. pH3 has a higher boiling point because it's got dipole and instantaneous dipole. SiH4 is lower because it only has instantaneous dipole. The same thing here. Germane versus arsine. This has got a permanent dipole. Higher. They're comparing. Do you know they're very careful in how they compare? They're very careful because they're comparing two things in the same number of electrons. Well, how do you know? Rather than looking at the periodic table for the number of electrons, they're using molecular math as kind of a guide. I think using the total number of electrons is better. Um, this is confuses some people because why are you using molecular mass? You know, it's not gravity that's holding these together. You know, if you have a water droplet in space, you know, the water droplet is held together by IMF. There's no gravity. And so, um, mass is a bit tricky here. And so what they're doing is they're using the mass as a kind of a proxy for number of electrons. But we would better just use the number of electrons. But traditionally, this is what we've done. We use molecular mass. The bigger the molecular mass, the more electrons it must have. And so we want to compare things that have a you know, similar number of electrons. So something like this, something that's nonpolar like bromine, look at the boiling point. It's 59. That's nonpolar. But if you look at something that's polar, like carbon monoxide, it's boiling point is minus 182. So here we have something that's non-polar, and it's got a screw portion, but it has a much, much higher boiling point. This is not a fair comparison. What we have to do is, when we do a fair comparison, is we have to keep one the same, probably, and then compare it. And so in this case, we're keeping the number of electrons. The bromine, the RQ, and ICL have the same number of electrons. The molar mass is comparable. And therefore, and polarity is determinant. That is, is it got a permanent dipole or a instantaneous dipole? These have permanent dipole here, bromine chloride. And so the yellow here are the dipole dipole interaction. And these are permanent, so these are time average. But in one instant of time, the dipole could go bigger or smaller. That would be the instantaneous dipole. Typically, instantaneous dipoles are weaker, unless you have a lot of electrons. If you have a lot of electrons, then the instantaneous dipole can be a bit stronger, quite a bit stronger. The um, last type of ion that's discussed are the hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are unusually large permanent dipoles. And so um, hydrogen bonds occur when hydrogen is bonded to fluorine, the most electronegative, oxygen, the second most electronegative, and nitrogen, the third most electronegative. And so if we take the top three electronegative, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, um, it's going to create a highly polar bond. And so hydrogen bond is when we have an unusually large dipole, permanent dipole. Um, it's not really a bond. It's an IMF. Um, it's quite a bit weaker than a bond. You know, um, and so, I'll put bond in quotation marks. And so when hydrogen's bonded to fluorine, we get big delta minus and big delta plus. Bonded to oxygen, 
same thing. Big delta minus, big delta plus. Nitrogen, same thing. Big delta plus, delta minus. However, chlorine, no. Chlorine is the ordinary delta plus and delta minus. Chlorine is not in the top three. And so this is not an unusual dipole. This is just a regular dipole. These are unusually big dipoles. And so H bonds would be the third I enough to talk about. And these are unusually large dipoles. And the bigger the charge, the stronger the uh, attraction is. Okay, I guess we're out of time. Let me stop here. All right, I guess I didn't quite make it. I'm in chapter. I'm in chapter six. I'm out of sync a little bit. This morning, yeah. Until we get caught up. Well, anyway, have a nice Thanksgiving. We'll see you guys. Monday. Titration lab. Yeah, if you have your titration lab, go ahead and turn that in. Thanks.